demonstration gods. <laughs> and hope that everything works as planned. It was a bad cable. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like much of a sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just going to anger the... Uh, hopefully not. All right, so we have an opening hymn by St. Bill, um, who also goes by Nick, um, given to him in a vision by the Honorable Chat GPT. If you want to be a master of the code you write, use Emacs, my friend, and your skills will take flight. With its powerful features and customizable interface, Emacs will help you write code with grace. You'll be able to navigate through your files with ease and make edits with precision with just a few keys. So if you want to be a hacker who can tackle any task, Emacs is the way to go. It's the editor you should ask. And then this is the reading of the day. Straight from the GNU Emacs website, it is an extensible, customizable, free slash Libre text editor and more. At its core, it's an interpreter for Emacs Lisp, a dialect of the Lisp programming language with extensions to support text editing. Uh, so this is a screenshot here from the GNU Emacs website. And it's, uh, if you can't read it, it's just listing things like um, content aware modes. We'll get into what modes are in a second. Uh, built-in documentation, Unicode support, um, highly customizable, which we'll do some of our own beginner customizing today. And then uh, I'd like to just clue in on this bottom middle one. This is a wide range of functionality, project planner, mail, news, to do, IRC chat, um, full-fledged IDE for multiple different programming languages. Um, and then also it has the package manager where you can use GNU Emacs approved uh, packages. You can use non-GNU uh, packages and then the Melpa package manager, which uh, are just kind of like repos if you're used to Linux distributions at all. And then the sermon today, we'll go over uh, my personal usage of Emacs, how I got started, how to get started yourself, some of the basic terminology and philosophy behind uh, behind just the understanding of getting started, navigating throughout Emacs, figuring things out. We'll write the most basic of basic config files if you're following along, and then we'll create our first org file to see how powerful the org mode is. Any questions so far? All right. So my usage of Emacs, I've tried it many, many times before. Not quite 25 years ago. Um, but I would say in the last five years, I've tried it on and off a few times, and it never really stuck. It was uh, bloated, convoluted, um, and I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. But after, uh, after doing some soul searching and trying out Notion uh, and uh, Obsidian as some kind of like note-taking softwares, I was flipping between that and uh, Todoist, which is a task manager, and then that between like whatever Gantt chart software I could find that was free and open source, which doesn't really exist much. On top of that, doing programming and having lots of projects that I wanted to complete and trying to keep track of my to-dos, my research items, my notes, and then also translating that into code blocks uh, proved to be uh, uh, like the perfectionist just dilemma where I, I could never get started on something and unfortunately that just was perpetuating throughout my life uh, and then in November I made a commitment to myself for the Nano Remo, which is the National Novel Writing Month and I decided I'm going to blog every day and I'm going to learn Haskell because I hated myself uh, about halfway through I gave up on Haskell but I didn't stop blogging and I ended up changing to Emacs and decided this this is the software I need to learn. And the reason and the way I came to that was because of all of those integrations, the to do's, the project management, being able to do literate programming, so coding and then writing paragraphs and headers, and then uh, evaluating that and being able to export it as a blog. Emacs was the, the tool for that. And 
ultimately I ended up blogging more about Emacs in November than I did about Haskell, uh, which is fine with me and something I've stuck with um, and will continue to use, hopefully. Other perks of it is I'm able to automate in between various uh, Emacs modes. So I can have an org file. Uh, we'll go over like more of that later. I can have a, an org file with an Emacs that has uh, like a, a NIM script that I'm working on to make uh, make uh, like a C2 server or C2 client. And then using org, I can extract all the code from it and create the NIM file itself. And the org file that lives there, that is what I edit the code with. And I can have paragraphs and links and pictures and all of this useful documentation built into the org file itself. And when I actually want to compile the code, it's only a few commands that extracts all the code in line, puts it into another text, compiles it, and then I can run that executable. Um, and you can do that with pretty much any language. Uh, Python being in cybersecurity, you can use that pretty easily. Easily, and we'll run a Python script within org mode as well. And then uh, C++ and C# -sharp are just the four languages I've used personally um, for actual task and not learning Haskell. <laughs> uh, and then finally, it's a flat file system, so I can take my .org mode files. I can use uh, any number of text editors that support a .org extension, like a .markdown extension. It is a, a markdown uh, uh, file format. And I can take those .org files and take them anywhere, even if Emacs were to stop working for some reason. Um, and then Emacs has been around, like the original Eric said, for more than 25 years. I think it's going on 40 years. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, very soon. It, it was old when I started. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really mature. And the, 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 fe the updates and the features that are implemented are slow, but when they, they happen, they also very much maintain extensibility of the software, um, more so than just trying to say, here's a new gimmick. Uh, they, they want you to be able to customize it and hack on it in the true hacker sense of the, the 70s and 80s, of just figuring out how something works. And that's why I have decided to use Emacs. Um, how I would, how I started and how I would recommend you start if you've struggled before is start on the OS you use every day. If you notice at the bottom, I'm using dirty Windows 11. I hate it so much, but I need it for work. Uh, and I would start with the vanilla blank copy. I wouldn't download uh, Evil Mode, Doom, Space Max, or uh, I think those are the big three. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't download any of those because they add a lot of extra functionality that A, you haven't had a good foundation of using Emacs before to start using. And then some of them like Doom expects you to be proficient in Emacs vanilla to start with. Uh, and doesn't really give you a great documentation um, springboard to jump off of. And then Evil and Space Max, those are using Vim or V key bindings. So if you are really used to v, v, VI or Vim, then you can use one of those uh, to go into Emacs. It's just whatever you really want to do. I would start with the blank vanilla and kind of work with what uh, that offers. And then a lot of purists will say to use the keyboard only. Um, it doesn't really matter. I will use both just depending on how things are going. I mostly use the keyboard because of the shortcuts. Uh, but when I'm navigating a, a, a file structure, a directory, I will probably just click on something because it's slightly easier than pressing the arrow key down 50 lines until I get there. Uh, and then I also scroll a bit on my, my scroll pad. That's just a little bit easier. And then I would read or watch some basic usage of it. System Crafters is a YouTube channel I'd recommend for that. They, uh, they're pretty good at explaining things and they're mostly dedicated to Emacs with a little bit of uh, GNU geeks in there, which I would not recommend to anybody. <laughs> Any questions so far? All right, so some of the basic terminology. We have uh, commands and shortcuts. Commands uh, being something that looks like a phrase, like find-file or save-buffer. 
a shortcut is uh, a link to a command. So the uh, c-xc-f, this would be uh, finding a file, but um, note that this C, this capital C, is going to be associated with the control key. Uh, so the way you would do this is you would pr press and hold the control key, and then you would press X. Um, you could keep you could keep holding down control, but you do need to release the X. And if you you probably can't see it because of how small it is, but down here is where your command's being um, typed in. You see that it turns into a capital C dash X. Um, if I wanted to then continue this shortcut of finding the file, I would then press and hold the control key again, and then press and release the F key, and that will execute the shortcut find dash file. And you can see here, you can type in the file. I'm going to press Control G now to uh, cancel or quit out of that. Uh, but the, the main takeaway here is that when you see a notation, you're looking up something to do um, on Google or the manual, whatever. If you see a notation that is the capital letter dash, that is going to be one of the keys on this table, uh, with the most common being the meta key which is just the alt key, um, the control key, which is the control key. Um, and then sometimes on maybe a Linux specific package, you'll see the super key, which is a capital S. Um, and that'll be what's like normally the Windows key. Uh, the Windows key is not used in Windows because it's permanently key bound to that, um, which is kind of useless for typing in anything else afterwards, uh, which is fine. So uh, the takeaway here, commands and shortcuts, shortcuts are bound to commands. You can also execute any of the uh, shortcut commands by typing in the meta key, so alt x. That'll bring up this prompt with the m dash x. And if I wanted to do find file here, I could just type in find file and that would execute the same command the shortcut does. I know that's a brain dump. We'll get into some hands-on exercises in a second. Uh, then we have windows versus frames. The entire outline here, the, the white bar with the menu bar and um, like the, the new file here, that is all what's called the frame in Emacs. With individual uh, buffers here, and I could split it, individual buffers here being windows. So if you are killing a window, that means you are destroying one of these, you're not destroying the overall frame. Um, and this was terminology before the Windows operating system existed, and so they decided to invert it. But we will kill that. And uh, just note that if you see a kill window, it is not going to close your window. Um, but if you see a kill frame, it will close uh, this entire program. Um, and you sometimes want that, just depending on what's going on. The Windows. Um, they hold what are called buffers, and so these are um, kind of like files that just exist in memory. You edit the buffer, and then if you want to save the buffer, then you would that buffer would then be saved to the file that you're editing. <coughs> you can have uh, non-file buffers, like a scratch buffer is common. That's just kind of a blank spot in memory that you could type in commands, type in just a note to yourself, whatever, and you cannot save that, but you could save it to a file. Your scratch buffer is erased upon uh, booting up Emacs. And some of the other buffers are like that. Like, uh, and those are notated. So the buffer I'm in now, you can see, is uh, whatever the file name is. If it's a buffer that is not a specific file name, it'll be started with an asterisk and end with an asterisk. And then finally, um, a buffer is, um, is interpreted by the mode it is in. So there are major modes and minor modes. You can only have one major mode at a time, and you can have any number of minor modes that are compatible with the major mode. Uh, major modes are things like org mode. This is displaying the org file here um, with the, the header, the indentation, the table. Uh, a minor mode would be the org presentation, which is what I have going on. Um, and we could see the difference here. If I exit the org present, 
Uh, so this is the major mode, and what I just exited out of was the, the minor mode. And let's just start this over. And uh, other major modes would be um, like a C major mode. It would be for displaying C files. And then you could have minor modes for interacting with C files um, or uh, auto-completing C files. You could disable those, enable those however you see fit. Uh, but just remember, when you are starting out, you can only have one major mode at a time. Navigating and figuring things out. Uh, so this is where we can do some of the, the hands-on so I guess you, <laughs> uh, but you can open and close a file with Control X, Control F. Uh, then you can type in whatever you want with an autocomplete, which is really useful. Um, and then you can just press Enter at a directory to display the directory. Uh, so if I were to do that here, I will actually open up another buffer and then, so it opens up the directory here. I know this is probably pretty small, but you can kind of just tell us what a ls looks like in, in Linux. Otherwise, we can save a buffer. So if I did Control X, uh, Control S, it tells me no, ne no changes needed to be saved at this time, which is correct. I haven't edited anything. And then if I wanted to kill the buffer of the directory on the right, I could do Control X, uh, K and that will kill the buffer. And if you notice, the only buffer I have open right now is the uh, presentation for tonight. And so there's two windows open, and when a window doesn't know which buffer to open, or if there's only one remaining, it will duplicate it. Um, but you can kill a window, as long as you're not killing a buffer, and your buffer will stay open. So if I kill this window now, we see the, bu the window goes down to one window, and the buffer remains the same. Yes? Do you have to have a window open for every buffer you have open? No. Okay. No. Does, for the windows you open, does it create its own process? Like, say you got one somehow hung? Yes. It's running yep. its own PID? Yep. I, I don't know about PID, um, but they are all handled independently. Where, um, so I ran into this with Haskell a lot. I would crash my GHC, which is the Haskell compiler, often, <laughs> and I could kill that within Emacs, restart it, and then recompile from the other program without any issue. Gotcha. Any other questions? All right. Some other commands are here. I won't completely bore you with. Uh, those, but you can uh, switch between windows. You can do a side by side with the Control X3, and then we can close Emacs completely with Control X and then Control C. Um, and I make made a note here: don't be afraid to just close everything and restart it. I did that probably multiple times an hour when I was first learning uh, Emacs because I would make a, a change or an option or I'd press a key combination and something would happen and I wouldn't know how to get out of it. And so you can just close out of it and, and restart. You won't lose any progress on files. The autosave is, is pretty legit and they'll lock files um, in a temporary buffer as well. So you, it's really hard to lose things once you have it open. Um, and then finally, if you're in the middle of a command, like you have a, uh, let's see, you have the MX here and um, or any other command or shortcut here, and you're like, nope, I just typed that in wrong, you can do control G and that will quit or cancel out of it. Uh, so once you get kind of comfortable navigating, uh, I would recommend setting the theme of what you want. Um, they have some basic themes that you can choose from as first like a solarized dark is what I started with originally and then I did the space max theme not the space max config and that is what I'm using now uh, you I would set the theme through this command you can set it in the dot emacs file um, but I would set it just with the the meta x the alt x load theme and then once you save that uh, reload and then open up your dot emacs file uh, 
and you'll need to add just a few more things to for quality of life and to do the uh, the org mode with Python executing. You'll add the visual line mode. This is wrapping the text. If you like that, if you don't like that, don't add this line to your .emacs file. And then uh, for the Python, you will need to add this line. So org babble is the minor mode that attaches to the org major mode that allows you to run uh, code within the org file itself. Um, and you actually execute the code from the source blocks. Um, you'll save that and then I usually just close Emacs and restart it. Uh, you can reinitialize it within Emacs. You can reinitialize the .emacs file um, running inside of it. I've only been with this for like 20 business days, so you'll have to look up how to do that yourself. Any questions so far? Yeah. How does it handle Python's indentation expectation? Uh, as long as, so in the org file, as long as you're indent, indenting it uh, with tabs or spaces consistently, it doesn't matter. It actually passes it to the interpreter itself. Um, and then from a .python file, like a .py file, um, it's just a text file, like any .py file would be, so you would have the same expectations, whether you're using Visual Studio Code or PyCharm or this. As long as the file is formatted like a .py should be, then you're good. Is it context aware? So if I'm inside of a, a started for loop and hit enter, it'll auto add the correct um, spacing for context? So in, in a .py file, yes. In the org mode, um, which you'll see is like smaller chunks of like literate, it's <coughs> I have it disabled. There are people who highly customize that. I have not, um, just because I haven't had a need for it. I, I kind of prefer to disable it on the smaller chunks because it just messes up for me and I didn't play with the, the settings too much. On the, the actual .py file though, um, when you have that open, it seems to work just fine for me. Um, but I, I don't normally go more than like three levels in. so. All right, and then org mode. I know I've said org mode multiple times. It is a major mode. Um, it was made for productivity, and so it is really good at notes, project management, and task management. Um, over the years, it has added in uh, literate programming. You can publish and export from it very well. You can publish um, like HTML pages. That's that's the page that will be should be linked in chat. Um, that was that came directly from these these slides. I did a uh, Control C Control E, and then I just selected the HT, HTML option, and it made the HTML page for me. Um, and then also on my blog, that is exclusively what I use now, um, and quite a few people just in the the Emacs community will just use Emacs and org for their their blog and website management. Uh, and then finally, presentations. Uh, it can do much more than that. And uh, one of the links in the, the resource links at the end has a quick start guide and you can see everything else that org mode can be used for. Uh, but we can do some hands-on stuff to see how easy it is. So I'm gonna split the window and then I'm going to find the file. And I'm gonna do the myfirst.org you see I have all of this here and you probably can't see that. I guess this was meant for a, uh, let's see. Org present, much better. All right, uh, so we'll have the preamble first. This is uh, usually denoted with a uh, shift three and octothorpe and then the plus sign followed by like title just all caps lowercase whatever colon space and then the uh, the title of whatever's going on and then I you do the same thing octothorpe plus sign author with whatever your name is and then date you can also add another one that is options uh, which I did here I believe 
and you can specify things like you don't want your task to be exported. Uh, this is really useful because when I'm writing blog post, I will have a bunch of tasks that I need to research this item or follow up on this or whatever because all of those to-do items and tasks I can show in a dashboard that shows um, when I start Emacs it will show me all my tasks for everything and it's context aware and tag aware but I don't want those to-dos being sent to my, my blog for example. I just want the headings and what I've written out and through the options, uh, which I, again, it won't show up on a presentation, uh, but if I were to do like options up here, options, I could do task nil, and this would make it to where whenever I exported this org mode file, no task, which would be this to do write a better example, no task would be uh, sent to the HTML page. Um, so this is a really good way to make sure that you're not sending out information you don't want to send out, and it's really powerful. You can change a bunch of different things there as well. Um, a basic heading is just an asterisk um, with a star. You can add basic text pretty much anywhere. A subheading, you can go seven or eight deep of subheadings. Um, a to-do or a task or a project will be after uh, any number of headings. So you could have one um, task here. You could have a project task here. And I don't have project. Uh, this would normally show up a different color, but I don't have it enabled for this file. So um, anyways, a task you can cycle through. Uh, with nope, you can cycle through, do done, and that'll mark it off as complete. You can then view all your completed tasks over a specific number of time, and then as you configure your org mode, um, you can have it even to where it timestamps when you completed it and timestamps when you started it, um, and we'll add up all of that for you where you don't have to change it. And then finally, the Python example here. Uh, this is all within an org mode file. I have begin source. So instead of the three back ticks that you would see in Markdown, uh, you type in this begin source. This, you specify which language you're working with. Um, in this case, Python. I have this uh, this results. I guess preceded by a semicolon or just a regular colon, and then output. What this means is that anything printed to the standard out uh, will be in the results here. Um, and then uh, this exports both. This is an export setting. Whenever I create an HTML file, it will export the code block and the result. I could have just result or just code, um, and it would only export that as well. So if we could change here, here instead of hello world, hello DC 864. And then in the results, when I execute this with control C, control C, we see that it changes to hello DC 864. It sent that to the Python interpreter uh, and did that. So, and then we can export it with control C, control E, H, O, and I'll do that actually slower. Control C, control E. These are all the export options I have available uh, currently in this directory. And so export as HTML is lowercase h. And then I'm going to do export as HTML file and open. That way it displays on the screen um, right away. Um, and then it's going to ask me if I want to evaluate this code block again because I am exporting the result. I could have multiple blocks chained together, sending the output from one to the next um, with text in between uh, describing what I'm doing, um, text or images or headings or tasks or whatever. And so I'm going to say yes because I do want it to um, export that block. And then finally you see we have uh, <coughs> this HTML page that I could then push to a blog site or print as a PDF and make a report. Um, I've started doing a lot of reports like this because of how easy it is for me to collect notes, put it in, have task, and 
Um, quite honestly, I wish I would have known about this before I wrote my master's uh, thesis because this would have been a lot easier. <laughs> All right, I'll close this window now. And then we'll do our closing, Kim. Anybody have any last questions? All right, so this is a sonnet by the holy venerable most advanced intelligence, GPG the third point five. O Emacs, the text editor of the gods, a tool so powerful and versatile, you let me code and write with ease and nod. To all my commands, however terse or complex, your modes so numerous and well designed allow me to customize every feature, and with your vast array of plugins aligned, I can extend your capabilities beyond measure. Your power knows no bounds, your potential vast. You are the Swiss Army knife of the digital age. I praise you now and forever will, at last, for you are the perfect tool for any stage. Emacs, my love for you will never fade, a true masterpiece, the best of its grade. And then closing remarks. Uh, my H my Emacs cheat sheet, I built this as I was going through and learning Emacs. I would recommend you build your own cheat sheet, but feel free to steal my org file and hack on it all you want. Um, you can print out the HTML file. I actually wrote these down physically as I was learning it first, and then I took it as like a homework assignment to make it into an org file for the sake of learning what I wrote down um, and making it presentable and that was really a good way for me to learn. Uh, this is the Orgma Quick Start. I would also recommend printing this out and having it next to you as you're going through. And then after I think five to seven um, business days I was uh, able to put aside the cheat sheet a little bit. There's much more to explore. Uh, Maggot is a Git tool which I've kind of fallen in love with a little bit. It makes Git even easier than it was before. Um, I need to do more productivity stuff. I'm really interested in Zettelkasten and Obsidian and Rome. And there's a built-in plugin with that called Org Rome. It's a minor mode for Org. Um, you can manage emails, IRC chats if you still do that, um, and RSS feeds. And then you can also fully automate between those things where you could have an email come in and you could send it to your um, like your org roam system tag it and then say you need it to do to to do whatever item and then that'll populate into your calendar and all of that's integrated with potentially one sheet uh, shortcut any final questions comments concerns want to get out of church preach too long all right so go forth and rejoice if you as you've heard about emacs